In a resurfaced clip that is now going viral, comedian, Egyptian satirist, and TV talk show host Bassem Youssef had advice for the U.S. Here he is in an appearance on Jon Stewart's Apple Plus program in June. Let's watch. You had an election and people kind of like didn't accept it and went and wanted to take things in their own hand. But the, 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 what happened in January 6th, I mean, the, the worst thing that happened on there is the comparisons. Like people like the pundit on the news were saying, mm -hmm. oh my God, this looks like a, a, a coup from the Middle East. And this kind of hurt my feeling because, you know, <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Be, no, like, you know, like, first of all, first of all, when we have a coup in the Middle East, it works. <laughs> you guys suck. You guys. We're new. You, this is you, new. You are, you, We're you, trying. Keep, keep, keep to what you do best, toppling democracy in the other countries. Awesome, Youssef did not stop there. And then every time it's like, oh, coup in the Middle East, oh, uh, white ISIS, uh, Texas Taliban, get your own references. I mean, it's kind of, why are we being but dragged into this every you know time? We're every... hyperbolic, that's who we are. We, everything, you think I have you guys on here because I want to know what your lives are like? I want to know what's going to happen to us. <laughs> <laughs> You're the canaries in the coal mine. I just want to find out what the is going to happen to us. I think Basim Yusuf does a really brilliant job using comedy to reveal a lot of hypocrisies that we have in the world, especially when we think about geopolitics. I think he made a good point that the January 6th insurrection didn't really look like a strategically planned coup. I mean, Donald Trump was kind of at the helm of it. That's up for debate. But I think he makes a good point that we can't compare what happened on January 6th to a lot of coups in the Middle East. Also, he makes a good point to say that sometimes the United States military is involved in coups in the Middle East. They have no choice but to be terribly strategic and terribly effective when the United States is oftentimes on the other side. So I think this clip is going viral because of his recent exchange with Pierce Morgan. But I think it's pretty solid geopolitical commentary and still relevant today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just the the way that a lot of people and uh, politicians and leaders and groups on the left side of things have, again, tried to label January 6th and the events of that day as basically a full-blown coup in an attempt to topple the United States government. As he points out, like, no, that's, that's not actually what happened. And obviously, you've had comparisons in the United States by people saying that it's, you know, the worst thing uh, or on the same sort of level of what happened on September 11th, 2001, or what happened in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and it's just, it, it's insane that the, the sort of the r rhetoric around that is, has risen to that level. It just doesn't make sense when you look at what actually happened. You know, nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, most people, I included, are not defending what happened on January 6th, but it's also not the same is saying, you know, this was uh, clearly a coordinated attempt to overthrow the United States Congress and install a dictator. You know, that wasn't going to happen. There were backstops. That was never actually going to be the case. But we see, again, as this, uh, you know, in a, in a lighter way, pointed out that that's just silly to make those kind of claims. And obviously, I, I think the, the lighter touch is something that the Biden administration could use when you look back at the speeches that the president has given about democracy or whatever he, he chooses to use as sort of the representation of what was under attack that day. I'm reminded specifically of the speech, a uh, very angry speech he gave in Philadelphia uh, before the midterm election where, you know, he was bathed in red light and very dramatic and flanked by Marines. And it was just sort of this very authoritarian speech condemning uh, these attacks on democracy or whatever he chose to call it. And, you know, as that comedian just pointed out, you know, this is not really a threat to actual democracy. Our, our government was not going to fall. We weren't going to end up in a country that was not governed by the Constitution. That just wasn't the case. And so I, I think it is nice that people can now poke fun at those who are claiming that this was a full-blown coup, because it wasn't. Yeah, I think the folks that were chanting, hang Mike Pence, the folks that were looking for Nancy Pelosi and AOC, yeah, they should be held accountable for trying to kill people that are in public office in the United States. Uh, I think framing this as, a, as an attempted coup is it the thought that counts when it comes to a coup? Maybe. I think when we found out that the FBI knew about a lot of the planning around January 6th before it happens, happened, told us that perhaps they knew that it would go the way it did. I'll never forget the Azalea Banks tweet where she posted someone scaling the wall to get into the halls of Congress and said this is crackhead behavior. I think uh, we need to be really real about January 6th and say, because it was so unorganized, how the heck did they get into the congressional building? Why is the security 
so poor that even people that were not wielding massive weapons like we see in so many attempted coups, how did they get in? How did they overpower the security that was there? And if the FBI had intel, why wasn't there more security there? There's a lot of questions around January 6th, but I think Bassem Youssef's point here is that a lot of Americans don't understand what goes on in other countries. And a lot of what goes on in other countries, these coups, these episodes of violence, these wars, are funded by the United States. United States dollars and the US military is oftentimes the ones wielding the weapons or supplying them. But we have the privilege in the United States to not fully understand conflict, to not fully understand suffering abroad. And so when the United States gets involved, we have the US Congress never voting to send troops but we have the State Department and the federal government and Congress voting to fund the Pentagon, voting to fund the military. And they make decisions on behalf of the American people with US dollars. And we never see the end of it. We never see the outcome of it. We never see what happens. And still, even with the troops that we are sending to Haiti now, we're doing it through the United Nations. So Congress never has to have a vote on it at all. There's a lack of democracy in the United States when it comes to foreign policy decision making. And I think it's time for that to change. But Bassem Youssef makes a really good point that the American people have no idea what conflicts are like abroad. Yeah, yeah. And I do think uh, sort of the, the whole reality that you just described there is another great argument for why uh, this idea that personnel is policy is absolutely true. Because when you're in the executive branch and you have all these sort of avenues you can use to get around Congress and the people's elected representatives, the people you put in the positions and have that power is actually very important to what happens both here at home and, of course, around the world, uh, thanks to the United States. But in that clip, you know, despite the brief levity there, tensions are obviously running very high worldwide. And so watch here as a CNN reporter on the ground in the West Bank is confronted by a protester. Because this is kind of where the clashes keep ha happens. So, all right. You are genocide supporters. You are not welcome here. Genocide supporters. CNN. CNN. Genocide supporters. And so obviously that's sort of the, the real world implication of what is going on around the world, not just sort of uh, the fun comic sides talking about what's going on domestically or internationally. Uh, but in that clip, you know, you see somebody who, again, is accusing CNN of being on the side of the genocide supporters, which, of course, to most people who live in Gaza, that would be the Israeli government, even though it was the Hamas terrorists that most recently launched their attack into Israel and slaughtered, you know, more than 1,300 people, including babies, women, children, abducted American citizens as well. Um, CNN, you know, might be used to getting uh, negative treatment from some people here in the United States, but that's just a whole nother level. That's actually people who don't appreciate the freedom of the press and people who think there shouldn't be free expression and you shouldn't be able to report the news, even though CNN was there just sort of taking a feel for what it's like on the ground there. Uh, what do you make of that? And I, I mean, credit to that CNN reporter. That looked absolutely harrying. Yeah, it was good that it didn't end up in any sort of retaliation from the reporter just kind of standing there. Uh, I can understand people being pretty upset with mainstream press and their coverage of the conflict. And I think this video shows a turning point where people are possibly going to start hold the, holding the press accountable for their role in war, their role in fomenting support in a nation for intervention, in this case, the United States. I think people are really holding media accountable in a way that is probably necessary. We have the freedom of the press in the United States, but we can also hold the press accountable. We can also scream at them if they say things that we don't like. And I think that's a good part of, the, of a functioning democracy as well. Uh, the alternative to someone yelling at a reporter is them getting bombed. We had journalists literally get hit with an Israeli shell in Lebanon this week. And so I, when I think about the press and when I think about the role of the press in covering conflict, they absolutely need to be protected so they can tell the truth. But we can't pretend that the press is always non-biased. I'm sure that there was a reason that Israel hit those journalists in Lebanon. They're probably pretty inconvenient if they're reporting uh, on the war crimes that Israel is, is committing in Gaza. And so I think that there are a lot of reasons for people to be upset with the press right now and hold them accountable for the things they're saying, the things they're doing, and their role in war. I think there's a reason that journalists become a target by governments when they're reporting on a war. No one's free of bias, really. So I think, you know, shouting at a journalist when you're seeing so many of your people killed 
uh, is is probably him showing restraint in that case. And I think we'll, we'll probably see more of this. But I think holding one journalist accountable for all of what CNN is doing maybe doesn't make sense. Maybe we need to go to the top of those at CNN who are making those decisions. Yeah, it often isn't the reporters on the ground who are the ones making the decisions. It's oftentimes editors or producers or others. Uh, and I would point out that in places like Gaza, both in this current situation and before, they have purposely put their terrorist infrastructure, weapons, intelligence centers, and other things in buildings where journalists are present to intentionally use them as human shields with the hope of keeping the Israelis from taking out those terrorist targets. Um, and of course, Israel generally warns them with either a roof knock or phone calls and other things like that. So just because journalists are being hit, which is, of course, a tragedy, does not mean that the terrorists did not also have something to do with why those locations were struck. Uh, in any case, again, a lot more to discuss on this and around the world. We'll be back with more Rising after this.